going on. <laughs> Uh, a lot of it sounds actually fancy and, and things like this, but uh, uh, primarily what I do is teach all of you. So uh, I'm really pleased to be here today. Thanks to Dr. Yalda for inviting me. And uh, it's Bill Love Camp, Madam Tutu. What are you doing here? <laughs> so I actually have I have high hopes and uh, uh, big expectations keep you enthused and uh, it's going to be the best classroom experience you've ever had. How's that? <laughs> like, I don't know about this. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is specific to gender and disasters and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit with you about what we mean by that. And uh, I have four core ideas or core, four core issues that I'm going to discuss. Uh, some of them you may have heard about, but I need to talk about them briefly to sort of get us to the point where we can talk about how to uh, promote equitable response to disasters. And those are going to be, first I'm going to talk about stratification. Is anybody a social science major in here? None of, oh, the, uh oh, what's your major? Social studies ed? Okay. Alright, uh, we have the same thing at my university, social science teacher certification, so it's probably the same thing. I won't pick on you. You're off the hook. How's that? <laughs> I'm going to talk about stratification. I'm also going to talk about gender and what we mean by gender. And I will continue then and talk about social vulnerability. And then finally, what that all means for uh, response and equitable recovery. Before we begin, I actually want to say that you have a beautiful campus. I really like this place. Uh, I've known about Millersville, of course, because of the Center for Disaster uh, Research. There we go, Research and Education. Like I had that before. Uh, that, so I've known about you. And one of my uh, colleagues who I do some research with is actually a graduate of sociology, I believe I'm correct in saying this, of sociology here at Millersville. And he now works at the Disaster Research Center in uh, Delaware. So, uh, but it's, it's neat to be here. And uh, I, had, I wanted to ask you before I go, what is the one thing that I need to do while I'm here that's not going to get me in trouble? Like in the area, yes. Send your eat a burrito in Lancaster City. Oh. Well, say it. It's a burrito place. Send your eat a burrito. Great. Burrito. Okay. Is that going to give me trouble on the plane tomorrow? I've never had trouble. <laughs> 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 I'll be honest. Right. I have I have little planes to take back home. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anything? I thought it, my my son. I have a five and a half year old son. He loves the Hershey Factory. Uh, he doesn't know it yet. I really I love the Hershey Factory, I think. Uh, but he loves Hershey bars nonetheless. And I thought I could go there. Is that worth it? Yeah. Chocolate bowl. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I live there. I live in Hershey. Do you? Yeah. It's, it's all right. You can't get into the actual factory yet. But they're going to close it soon. Then they're going to have tours and stuff like that. So, uh, maybe so they have Chocolate time. World. Yeah, Chocolate World is the ride. Is there, is there stuff that I could like buy a stuffed oh, yeah. Hershey bar or something yes. for him? Okay. Yeah, the the tour, at the end of the tour, they put you in this massive store. Uh, of course they buy, do. Buy, buy. Of course they do. <laughs> okay, well, I may do that. Uh, I may be up in Hershey later today. So, um, the, my colleague, I think he's, he may meet me later. So, we'll see. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, but I love, I, I love the drive. I drove in from Harrisburg. That's where my plane came in. And uh, it, it's really pretty out here. Uh, everything's really, really green. Very, very green. Uh, and it might, is it unusually that way, or is it just sort of typical? Typical. Um, back home, I'm from East Central Illinois. And uh, I saw all of these big farms silos and that's that's nothing unusual for me I obviously know that there are Amish that live around here uh, but when you said Hershey is in your backyard uh, if you were to come to, to uh, my town 
I would say, well, one of the things you might want to do, particularly during the fall, is go up to the Great Pumpkin Patch. Uh, it's, it's in the Amish community. Uh, there's an Amish community 15 miles north of me, about 4,000. And uh, so coming through here, you look at some of the homesteads and the big farms, and it was very, very much like home. Uh, but half of the corn crops are out back where I'm at uh, in central Illinois, and I haven't mowed for a month probably. So uh, it, it's nice, and I'm very, very glad to be here. And again, I thank Dr. Yalda and, and everyone that put this on. And I've been very impressed by the student turnout. So we get ready to write five page papers. Uh, all right, uh, so to continue, let's, let's get back to what I'm actually here to talk about. Uh, gender and disaster. Now, there's a backstory to some of this. Uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time researching and, and focusing on gender issues and disasters and, and what that means. And one of my very good colleagues, so she's a, a, a very good friend and a colleague, and, and I work with her on gender and disaster issues. And she's a founding mother of this area. Uh, her name is Elaine Anderson. She actually taught a class in fall of 2010 for the uh, disaster center uh, here on campus. It wasn't on campus, but uh, online. And uh, she came back from after being for a couple of years out of the country. Uh, she does a lot of international work. Right now she's in South Africa. And she's focused on gender and disaster issues. And basically, any book that you pick up that discusses gender and disaster issues, Elaine's name is going to be there, I guarantee. And I've had the opportunity to work very closely with her for several years now. And she came back. We had a conversation a few years ago. She came back to the US. And she had been in Canada and in Europe and different places working on gender and disaster issues. She came back to the United States and she said, what's going on? What? We're not doing anything. And, you know, we think that we're a very progressive society and we're a developed country and all of these sorts of things. Uh, but she found that a lot of early work had been done in the United States and a lot of the, a lot of the fancy, jazzy disaster work has, has went elsewhere, okay? unless you have a Katrina-type event, and then, then people are going to pay attention to that here in the U.S. A lot of the work is, is, is international, and a lot of it needs to be. But people were not focusing, when she came back here to the United States, they weren't focusing on the United States. And she said, where is where's the gender presence? What are we doing about gender issues in the United States? We're still not where we need to be. So. Actually, last night I was sitting at uh, the talk for uh, Governor Richardson and a professor, uh, Jane Hannigan, Dr. Jane Hannigan, uh, wrote down her name as she was speaking. She stood up and she asked the governor, she said, what about women, women's issues? And uh, if you were there, you heard him not really respond. I'm not sure what he had to say about it. He actually asked the audience what they had to say about it. I was sitting there with all sorts of ideas. Then one of uh, your physics professors, I believe, she stood up and said, you know, one of the things that we have to focus on in the United States that, that still is, is very disturbing is maternity issues. I thought, you know what, that's, that's very important. My wife, in six weeks, is going to have a baby. <laughs> She's going to be this is probably the last trip I'm going on until after the baby arrives. Uh, she is going to be taking maternity leave. Then got me thinking about it, and you're right. This is a really important issue that that we still haven't figured out. And so those are just a couple of examples of the pressing issues of gender in the United States still. Uh, but I've been fortunate enough to work with my colleagues, Elaine and I, and one other person, Angela Devlin, who uh, runs uh, uh, foundations called the Mahila uh, Partnership, uh, the Mahila Foundation. It's a foundation, it's a nonprofit organization that does a lot of what we call grassroots work, going out into uh, communities and helping people on the ground respond 
recover from disasters, prepare for disasters. And the three of us have been working on this U.S. Gender and Disaster Resilience Alliance. So much of what I'm going to talk about today specifically pertains to the ideas that we have in this uh, alliance and also from the larger Gender and Disaster Network. It's an international organization and I'm part of that and Elaine and we're all part of that as well. And the, the goal is, of course, for our alliance in the United States to eventually be a, a hub of the larger gender disaster network. So the ideas that I talk about today are mine, but also they're the larger goals of the organizations overall that I speak on behalf of, okay? Also, if you have any questions while we're going through, just feel free to ask. This is like a classroom. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about something that we call uh, stratification. Now, there's one person in here that is a social science student and probably knows something about stratification, but I'm going to ask the rest of you, if you can define stratification for me, what does it mean when we talk about a society being stratified? Any ideas? Yes? I don't necessarily want to compare it for past, the different levels of kind of where you can kind of get, like let's say, Last one for women and then and then and then and so on and so on. Like, what's your name? Johan. Johan? Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, you gave an example of a system of stratification, the caste system. We have a system of stratification in our society called the social class system. All right, it's a systematic layering of people into different groups in society or into strata. It's the term stratification. And we do this on a number of bases. We stratify people on the basis of age. And we have age groups, don't we? Age cohorts. We stratify people on the basis of their level of education. You all are probably part of freshman or sophomore, junior, senior cohorts or groups, which is a sort of micro level system of stratification. We stratify people on the basis of ability or disability, on the basis of race and ethnicity, basis of sexual orientation, on the basis of gender and biological sex. So there are an infinite number of ways that we cluster people into groups. That is not inherently a bad thing. But what we often do then is when we divide, divide these people into groups, then we offer them resources. And oftentimes the resources that are offered to them in these different groups are done so unequally. So men and women will have different opportunities, access to resources in the United States, for example. Women were granted privilege of voting in 1920, men just always had that. That isn't really fair, is it? That's an example of inequality that's built into a system of stratification. And we'll talk a little bit later about what that means for disasters. But these systems of stratification are simply part of every society that you go to. I don't know of a single society culture that does not have some system of stratification and then inequality is often attached to them because of the differential access to resources, goods, services, education, all of these other things that people have based on these groups. And in the United States we have what's called an open system of stratification that we can move up and down within those systems. But in the example that Johan gave, the, the caste system is a closed system. There are some, time, some systems that if you're born into one caste, you can never escape it. You can't get out of it. Like in the United States, if you're born of a, of a working class family. I, I actually grew up a, in, a, in a working class family. Uh, my parents were, were manual laborers, and uh, later my mom worked at a convenience store. My dad worked at a, a welding facility. 
and I grew up being a first generation college student, right? But I was able to, through a series of, of uh, opportunities, some of those that I didn't do anything to get, I was fortunate to be born male, which automatically provided me with opportunities that my sister hasn't had the same access to. But I was able to then improve and be upwardly mobile, just like most all of you are. But in some of those systems, they're closed, they're fixed, and we can't do anything about them. In my classes, I actually I use this diagram as an illustration of a system of stratification. I don't have any idea what this is or where it came from. I Googled it uh, several years ago, and I just thought, hey, this is a, an interesting illustration. I discuss social class and stratification and being mobile as opportunity ladders. And some of us have a lot of ladders that are available to climb. And they go really high. But others of us don't have many ladders, and they don't take us to the same places. So it's an illustration of how these systems of stratification work. Now, you'll notice that I mentioned gender as one of those ways that we stratify people. Most of the time, when we talk about gender, you automatically think of male and female. Uh, when we talk about differences in men and women and, and, and classify people into these two groups, we're basically referring to biological sex. We have, two, we have well, really the appropriate way to view this is not as, as a binary system as two categories, but on one end we have biological sex male, on the other end we have biological sex female, and there's a continuum, and, and you can fall anywhere in between. Because there are people that are born in our society with ambiguous genitalia. Where do they fit? So they're sort of outside of that boundary. But traditionally, in, in, in the literature, in, in our research, we, we primarily look at differences in men and women as biological sexes. A lot of people don't really understand the difference between the term sex and gender, and they use them interchangeably. Gender, for, for me, I'm a sociologist. Gender really is those sets of expectations that society attaches to the biological categories of being male and female. All right? So, Think of it in terms of roles, gendered roles. Your life is a series of performances. You're all, I'm performing here. Uh, you come to class, and, or you come to this presentation, and you're performing uh, not in the same way that I am. When you go out on a date, you're performing. In fact, sometimes you practice your performance before you go out. All right, so you're constantly performing. You're performing roles. and some of those roles are specifically designated for women. They've been assigned to women. These are women's roles, these are men's roles. And then there are some that we can all partake in. So the, the roles that we perform, that's what we talk more specifically about when we focus on gender. Those roles that we perform, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. And there's a lot of gendered inequality in our society. I have some statistics. Let me get completely away from my notes here. Uh, I have some statistics that I've pulled together just to show you an example of gendered inequality that exists in our society today. The governor mentioned it last night. Um, actually, he said, well, we all know about the gender gap. And I thought, well, no, I don't know that we all do know about it. I do. Uh, some of the rest of us do if we read the papers, pay attention to uh, the news, uh, and then you'll know something wrong about it. Uh, that's <laughs> uh, but there's something called the wage gap, or the gender pay gap, that exists in our society today. It's a perfect example of what my colleague Elaine Anderson said when she came back to the United States and said, what have we been doing? There are still inequalities that exist that we need to address. We can't just say, well, everything's where we need to have it. Everything's fixed, so let's move on. Let's move to something else. And the wage gap, <clears throat> or the gender pay gap, is some very real evidence of gendered inequality. 
excuse me. So I could find some 2009 statistics, and this was uh, on the American Association for University Women website. And uh, there was a document that I found, it's called The Simple Truth About the Gender Pay Gap. <clears throat> and you, you'll see this referenced um, in multiple places, and it's, it's very consistent with what I have here. Is that in the United States, women and men do not make the same amount of money. Hopefully that doesn't come as a shock to any of you uh, who are enlightened and, and well-educated in here today. But the current pay gap is at about 77%. So men and women don't make the same amount of money. For, for all of you college students sitting in the room, think about this. When you leave college, you apply for jobs. You're going to be entering this world. Women make, on average, 77% of what men do. 77 cents for every $1. Uh, now, I always say for, for the males in the room, uh, you have that unearned privilege of not really having to pay attention to it if you don't want. But that's not being a very good citizen. And I would like to talk to your mom and tell her <laughs> what you just said. <clears throat> and you have to make it personal. You're going to, you have mothers, aunts, uh, sisters, you might get married one day, have daughters, and this is the very real effect of gender inequality. And I actually looked in Pennsylvania and gathered some information. A woman working full time in Pennsylvania is paid $35,000 per year. Basically what they do, of course, is they, they figure out what the average for all occupations is um, in states. They can do this by county. They can do it in a number of ways. And they average all of those totals out. And then they're able to control for like types of jobs and things such as that. But a woman working full time is paid thirty-five thousand dollars per year, while a man working full time is paid forty-six thousand dollars roughly a year. And it's a wage gap of about eleven thousand dollars yearly. Wage gap of about eleven thousand dollars. So this is demonstrating that there is a significant gendered inequality still. This is in occupations. And what I found particularly interesting is, the, is what follows. If the gap were eliminated, what could we do? What could these women do with those additional resources? And this is where it becomes very real, uh, particularly when I read things like this, that in Pennsylvania, working women and their families, if this gap were eliminated, would be able to do the following. They would have enough money for 85 more weeks of food. I thought about that, and yesterday I listened to, uh, I forget his name, I, I apologize for that, uh, but he was, he was talking about food. Oh, Orrin Hesterman? Yeah, yes, uh, Orrin Hesterman. Talking about food and food scarcities and feeding of everyone. And I thought, if we could eliminate this gender pay gap, that'd probably go a long way in helping they would have enough money for 85 more weeks of food. They would have eight more or eight more months of mortgage and utility payments. A lot of us could use that, I'm sure, couldn't we? 16 more months of rent, four more years of family health insurance premiums. Four more years of family health insurance premiums, that's a lot. And then he was talking yesterday also about the obesity epidemic and cost of health care. Of course, you're all familiar with that. It's not getting any better. 3,000 gallons additional gasoline. Imagine not having to, to fill your car until after you put that 3,000 first tank in or gallon. Uh, also then, What's integral and important about this is they are able to control for all of these factors. And, and they go on to say then that mothers pay a penalty, oftentimes, for having children of fa while fathers get a bonus. Mothers tend to pay a penalty for having children. That came up last night, the issue of maternity and maternity leave. That that's still a significant issue in our society. And, and 
women often will pay a penalty. Yep. Is that gender gap like prevalent in education as well? It exists. There are a few occupations where the gender gap is really, really narrow. Usually, usually those are really stratified. What I mean by that is that they're very much sex segregated occupations. So they're predominantly male with only a few women, or vice versa. And you don't, the gender gap sometimes is narrower. But it depends, again, on the occupation. Because in, I could give you examples where that isn't the case. Um, but there are some, some of the social services, uh, the gender gap is narrower. Uh, some of the, uh, in, in education, the gender gap is narrower. But that will vary from institution to institution, from type of education to type of education. Uh, it still exists. Uh, most of the time, if you think back to grade school, you had a lot of female teachers, the principals, the administrators, male. And that's changing. But it's constantly fluctuating. The national average is 77%. But if you look in like construction, the disparity is a lot greater. Uh, if you if you look in nursing, it's it's a lot narrower. Just as two examples. So it constantly fluctuates. Yep. When you say that we have to get a pay cut you know, after having a child, you mean like unpaid maternity leave versus well, there is there is unpaid maternity leave. What all, what research also shows is basically that eliminates women's opportunity for professional advancement more than men. When my wife takes leave, she's at least out guaranteed six weeks, but she may take several months off. And, and then she, obviously, she's out of the labor market. No, nope, not really labor market. Uh, but she's out of the workforce for three months, at least. So think about if you're trying to, to gain promotions and you're trying to be upwardly mobile within that, that system, can you imagine just taking six months off? See how that puts you farther behind? And, and that, that's actually in places that, that, that you experience good working relations. Sometimes women are fired, but they're not retained. And they, it's not overt, it's not apparent because it's illegal, but Bosses find really clever ways of, of replacing people in their jobs if you if you take extended leave. It's still not the case in every state where women need to have facilities for breastfeeding. So a lot of times women will make the choice to say breastfeed, for example, and stay home with, with children, and they simply stop working and the employer doesn't keep their job because they don't have facilities to take care of the children. So there, and, and I can go on and on and on, there are all sorts of examples, but basically when you're trying to, to move up that corporate ladder and, and you take time out, you're being penalized. If you're not getting paid, oftentimes, uh, and you know, we have family, family medical, family, Or FMLA, yeah. Uh, family Medical Leave Act. There you go, Family Medical Leave Act. That you're required to, uh, you can take time off and your jobs won't be eliminated, but you find all sorts of ways to get around that. So there's a sort of penalty, oftentimes, for women taking care of their children. And men are often exempted from it. Okay? So that's, that's sort of what I'm talking about with regards to that. Now, <clears throat> And they go on to say that women with children are paid 2.5% less than women without children. Again, that often has to do, when you're looking over the life course of someone's career, and they're taking time out to have children, and they're not working, they're losing some of those promotions. They don't get promoted as quickly and things like that. So it is very real. There are gendered inequalities. This is just one of them. But there are all many, many, many gendered inequalities in the United States that exist that are real. Now, I need to keep moving or I'm not going to get to where I need to go. Uh, I know that many of you as freshmen came in and you were reading a book, right? And because you have a symposium, 
you were talking about that uh, on Monday. And I think that's really neat, and there, there's a point to why I'm mentioning this. My students this summer, the incoming freshmen, and my university is basically the same size as, as Millersville, they read, they read Half the Sky. And this is a book talking about global gender issues of inequality and oppression. And if you, if you want a fun read, don't read this book. If you want something that is going to make you sit back in your chair with your mouth open and possibly cry, read Half the Sky. It talks specifically about Governor Richardson last night mentioned very briefly uh, female genital mutilation. We actually call it cut it. it the, the appropriate term, the more appropriate term is cut it. Um, and and Wukoff and Dunn in their book talk about why. It's, it's because the people aren't as receptive when you call it mutilation because of the, I'm not going to go into that. But anyway, so they discuss that. They talk about uh, sex trafficking and sex tra trafficking of like seven year old girls trading into prostitute, getting traded into prostitution. Uh, they talk about rape and instances of rape across the globe. It's, it, it's not something that you want to read because you think it's going to be fun to read it. It's not. But it is one of the most humanitarian books that I've read in a long time. And it really will make you think about inequalities, particularly a lot of gendered inequalities that exist. And in that book, there was something that um, former Secretary General of the, US, the United Nations, Kofi Annan, said that is pertinent to our discussion of gender. And it says it's impossible to realize our goals while discriminating against half of the human race. As study after study has taught us, there is no tool for development more effective than the empowerment of women. So a lot of what we do in the disaster research community focusing on genders, gender is about empowerment and being community-based and taps into some of these things. And these systems of stratification, these inequality, these issues of inequality, when a disaster occurs, they don't go away, all right? And that's why it's important to talk about gender and disasters, because they don't go away. And what do we mean by a disaster? Dr. Yalda may actually argue otherwise, but as a sociologist, I say two things. One, there is no such thing as a natural disaster. I know it's listed on here as natural disasters. Uh, I argue that all disasters are human-induced. Notice I did not use the gender-laden term man-made. Yes, men are largely responsible for many of these uh, technological innovations and things like that, but there is no such thing as a natural disaster. There are natural hazards. There are atmospheric events. There are, there are tornadoes, there are floods, there are earthquakes, hurricanes, all sorts of things that are hazards to us. But one of the reasons that they end up being disasters is because we place ourselves at risk. If we didn't live in a floodplain, would there be a disaster? If Hurricane Irene never made landfall, would it have been a disaster? not. So we take this approach, that there is no such thing as a natural disaster, that we constantly place ourselves at risk. I have some, some charts. I didn't show them. Uh, I didn't put them in here. Uh, but I have charts that show, like along coastlines, how many people live there and their, their longitudinal. So I looked 10 years ago current day, and you can just see population explosions on coastal areas. Folks, let me tell you, if you want to be living in harm's way, live in a coastal area. Build one of your multi-million dollar mansions on a rock cliff on the edge of the ocean. 
we place ourselves in harm's way. Sometimes we do this voluntarily. Sometimes this is forced on us. So poor people who live oftentimes in flood prone areas are doing so out of economic necessity. Or they don't have resources to go elsewhere. Then that's just one example. So we place ourselves at risk and sometimes we are placed at risk and living in danger and not able to, we don't have access to the resources, we're not able to prepare, we're not able to recover in the same way. Remember, gender is one of those ways that we stratify people. And so, social class is very important for understanding disasters and our ability to prepare for and recover. Poor people don't have the same opportunities as rich people. Race and ethnicity, ability and disability, sexual orientation, all of these are really important. And we can't necessarily talk about one without talking about all of the others. But what I do here today is try to talk just about gender and disasters. And primarily talking about women and men and opportunities and systems of stratification and how that influences our ability to prepare for disasters and to be resilient and to be able to recover from them. All right, so that's, that's how it all sort of fits together. Now let me also share with you a little bit about what we do as sociologists in studying disasters. If I can find it now, I can completely. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to share a picture. I'm going to do something different here. Two weeks, I think it was two weeks ago. I walked into my office and I opened up, and this was right, at, right uh, after Hurricane Ivan. And I open up the paper, and there's there's an opinion cartoon. In our daily Eastern newspaper, the campus newspaper. So of course I had to copy it. Folks, this is not how we talk about gender and disasters. Although, interestingly, talking about the gender uh, aspects of disasters, it wasn't until uh, 1978 or 1979 that we stopped calling all hurricanes female names. Before that, they were all women, those rotten women. Of course, you know, they're going to cause disasters. And they were being named female names by men at places like NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, so a bunch of probably rich white guys calling all of these hurricanes women's names. Um, it, that's not right. All right. And what they do now is they alternate those names. So just a little side note, this is not what I mean by gender and disasters. I mean the things that we just talking about uh, how men and women prepare differently, respond differently, and, and then where we can go from here. So I, I thought maybe you would, you would uh, enjoy that uh, at the expense of one of my students. Uh, unfortunately, I, I posted something online uh, about the appropriate way to uh, talk about gender disasters and how we actually name hurricanes, but I didn't do any more than that because I, the student, it, it was probably, I, I don't think the student was meaning to, uh, to give some sort of gendered analysis or be gender unequal or you know, anything like this, but still, this sort of stuff perpetuates the, this misinformation that we have about gender issues, about issues of inequality in a society, and then about disasters as well. Uh, and who knows, maybe this person lousy boyfriend. Uh, it wasn't male, by the way, that, that actually drew that. Okay, let me get to the next core issue that I promised that I would talk about, and that is the issue of vulnerability. I've mentioned it in different places in passing to this point, but I want to talk a little bit more about what we mean by vulnerability. Think about sitting in the chairs that you're, you are sitting in currently. You walk across campus at night and it's dark. 
you're vulnerable. Now, I don't know what crime rates are on Millersville's campus. I would suspect not a lot, not very high. Uh, but vulnerability basically means how susceptible we are to, to crime, to disease, right? all of these sorts of things. For me, I talk about vulnerability to disasters. And our vulnerability varies based on our social positions. Our vulnerability is based on these systems of stratification. Our vulnerability is based on the access that we have to resources to be able to prepare, to be able to recover, and so on. There was an article in the on August 29th, it was an inside of higher education. It was written by a sociologist, and they were talking about what, what we do as, as disaster researchers. And they said this, we try to understand that disasters are unique opportunities to study society, and that disasters, and this is, this is one of the important things, disasters are just amplified versions of everyday life. It's, it's just sped up in time. And, and so it's no different than studying society during normal times, if you will. We study how patterns of behavior that are often related to stratification, systems of stratification, unfold in disasters. Inequality does not go away when a disaster occurs. Even though the media and others might present it as such, well, look at everybody, now they're just getting along. Well, that might last for a while. But what about two weeks after the disaster has passed? Those inequalities, the opportunities that people had before the disaster, they're right back in place after. So they don't go away. These vulnerabilities don't go away. And that's what we seek to understand, and how we can then eliminate them, how we can seek to resolve these issues of inequality, unequal access to resources, goods, and services. All right, now we're doing on time. Speed up. Okay. What I want to talk, I'm going to move forward. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we in the research community argue for, what we advocate. And we're doing this as part of the U.S. Gender and Disaster Resilience Alliance. We're doing part of this as part of the, the Gender and Disaster Network. I do this in my research. Uh, we're trying to eliminate these vulnerabilities. And the question becomes how you can do that. There are a few things, a few uh, themes that we all must pay attention to and all uh, recognize as being critically important when we focus on disasters. The first is that even though it's not reflected in most hazard and risk assessments, when you're doing assessments of risks, usually it's just probabilistic risk. You go in and you say, okay, well, they live 30 miles from water, so the risk is this. We don't look at social risk oftentimes. We know then that the, uh, the gender divisions of labor, remember the roles that I talked to you about earlier, the roles that we perform, those aren't the same for women and men. And the gender division of labor then makes us differentially vulnerable. And that's for every person, that's for every household, that's for every community, that's for every society. That there are different and overlapping vulnerabilities that are very, very important. The second theme is that living con general living conditions and inequalities often increase women's exposure and susceptibility to hazards. A lot of people in a lot of people in emergency management professions uh, and, and a lot of the community members in general don't recognize this. And I always have to remind myself because it seems very, very simple and basic that inequality still exists and inequality often isn't recognized when you go out into the real world. It, it seems so basic to me, 
and probably maybe to, to you, but it doesn't happen that way. Uh, and, and evidence of this is that uh, last year, Elaine Anderson taught the class on gender and disasters for, for the grad program, the, the, uh, for, the, for the disaster center. So that's evidence that this is still a pervasive issue, something that we need to do something about. Uh, let's see, I'm going to move forward here a little bit and talk about some of the things that we need to do. Now the Gender and Disaster Network has put forth a call, said alright, this, this is what we need to do. Uh, the first thing is that we need it to get everybody on board. This is a human rights issue, this isn't just a women's issue. Sometimes I'm the only man in the room talking about this stuff. Uh, I have many colleagues that I work with, we have conference calls all the time, and I'm the only male voice. And I need more male voices as well. Because again, if we're not all working toward achieving equality, gender equality, we're never going to get anywhere. And back in 2004, I went to a conference in Hawaii, and Elaine Anderson actually uh, was one of the hosts of it, and it was a gender equality and disaster risk reduction conference. And we got a men's group together, and I was standing next to uh, people with uh, PhDs, men, that were working in their respective disciplines. I was talking with emergency managers, I was talking with Red Cross, and one of the administrators of the Red Cross, and they were, we, they were standing there saying, wow, I never knew that this could be a problem in disasters. I didn't know that women don't have the same access to resources. Are you kidding me? And that was in 2004, and we haven't made a lot of progress. So the Gender Disaster Network is is trying to promote uh, gender equal and gender responsive practices. And so what does that mean, really? Uh, that That's the most important part, I think. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to, could you give like, some examples of what are, what don't want to get them that get in a disaster? Um, well, women are often at increased, their vulnerability has increased. Um, I have, let's see, I didn't. If you look at this picture, this is, um, all of these pictures are from Bangladesh, and this typifies women's experiences with floods. I've done some research with that. And women often have to, they stay and take care of children, and men in disaster situations are often exempted from that. That when men will go off and either find work, or go off and be, be doing something in the community. And women are still at home. Uh, women also, women and men have different health issues. Okay? And we're susceptible to different things. Well, imagine the health issues of these women that are standing in flood water. And they're, I, I'm not going to be exposed to the same sorts of things. So medical problems in disasters medical needs, uh, feminine hygiene needs in disasters that aren't the same for, for men. And it's often really difficult for women to get access to the resources after the fact, particularly when you look in some different cultures. Uh, it, sometimes this is harder to see in the US because uh, in terms of gender equity, we're uh, a lot more uh, progressive than in some other cultures. But there are cultures where women are not allowed to, to leave the house by themselves. So when the men leave, a lot of times what happens is men leave home and they go search for work and they never come back. So in the aftermath of a disaster, they still need to feed the children. Well, women are at increased risk of violence, of rape, uh, because now they have to venture out and get food and water when culturally they're not, they're really not to, to go out by themselves because there's so much that 
gender uh, inequality. That's just one example of differential access to resources, particularly in disaster situations. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, you know, in some of the research you're talking about, rather than that kind of forcible in the house, there's also mm -hmm. many cultures that women are putting everyone else first, so that when there's exactly. a food distribution, you know, it's the men, <clears throat> it's the children, yes. and often, you know, there's been efforts to have you know, women need to be taken care of because they are taking care of the children, you know, and so there's also things that are going on very powerfully in the mediation mm -hmm. yep. as well. Absolutely. Women will take care of the family needs before theirs. And it's shown time and time again that after disasters, that everybody else in the household is fairly well fed and healthy, and women are deathly sick because they have gone without food, gone without water for long periods of time, don't take care of their needs, and, and of course, you know, I'm not surprised, I know what my mom did for me, right, uh, that my dad never did. So you see these things, you see these different ways of responding, and, and the women will put themselves last, but oftentimes they're, they're increased risk for a lot of health issues, and, and then one of the things that we do is we administer aid and, and uh, again, in the food uh, distribution talk yesterday, uh, we were discussing the fact that sometimes aid can be the wrong type of response. So he was talking about, he was talking about rice and how we in the U.S. ship a bunch of rice and I can't remember what aid Haiti, yes. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. We shipped a bunch of rice to Haiti. And what that ended up doing is putting the, the Haitian rice farmers out of business because our rice product was cheaper than what they were selling it for. And so it's counterproductive. A lot of times what we would do is send uh, medical supplies to other countries, and those medical supplies are absolutely ineffective. Uh, and so, so you have to be very careful about sending supplies and, and engaging in this disaster relief. And you have to be culturally sensitive. You have to also be gender sensitive. Uh, you have to figure out what the specific needs of the communities are and make sure that you're doing things in a culturally appropriate way. Make sure that you're asking the community what they need. Uh, just, to, just to summarize, the, the Gender Disaster Network says we all need to think big. We all need to understand how vulnerability is different for all individuals in every different society. To all different kinds of disasters, we need to think big and use a vulnerability analysis, which is what I've been talking to you about. The second thing we have to do is get the facts. Uh, vulnerability, they say vulnerability analysis is not optional, but it is absolutely necessary for equitable disaster response and recovery. The third thing that they say is that you have to, this is one of the most important things, work with grassroots communities. One of the things that I discovered in some of my research that I've done in Bangladesh, uh, with Bangladesh and flooding, is that these people really have it figured out. Yes, there's a lot of poverty and inequality, but particularly these women are really resilient. And they have some of the best ways of coping that I've ever seen. They're incredibly resilient. They have ingenious ways of coping. So when we try to provide assistance and response, we must be aware of the cultural context. We have to work with the community members, the grassroots community members. I don't care if that is in Bangladesh, if that is in Hurricane Katrina affected areas, or if that's parts of Lancaster County that have been flooded. What a novel approach. Ask them what they need. 
ask them what they need most and how you can best assist them. It seems really basic, but it is oftentimes completely ignored. As, as responders, we will go in and we do what we think is best. Never ask a single question about if this is what the communities need. So, working with grassroots communities, critically, critically important, and figuring out what they already do well and how you can help them better facilitate recovery. Number four, we have to do this in all of our lives, but resist stereotypes. Resist misinformation that's perpetuated. Don't automatically assume that what you hear in the media about people is true. Uh, again, it seems it seems so basic, but we, we often don't do this enough. Um, so do not, uh, yesterday was another talk on Japan, uh, earthquake, tsunami, and the response. It probably goes without saying then that we needed to resist the stereotypes. Don't pay attention to what the media is, is saying, right? There was a lot of misinformation being perpetuated, and that's the case in virtually all disasters. After Hurricane Katrina, folks, do you realize that 60% of the people didn't have cars? Something like 56% didn't have cars, so they couldn't leave. 40% were living in poverty. The official poverty line is approximately $12,000 for a person of one. A single person household, if you if you make less than about $12,000 a year, then you are living in poverty. But for a family of five, I think my sister's family of five, and I think it's about $25,000. That a family of five, if you make $27,000, you're not officially poor. The poverty line is really, really low. Uh, and it basically is uh, taking into consideration what you need to live. Food, shelter, clothing. That's it. No cell phones, no cars, no rent, none of that. 40% of the population in Katrina affected areas were living below the official poverty line. So that is, that's awful. So they didn't have the resources, and the media was, was basically providing us with a completely different story. Uh, number five, and this is also advocated in Half of the Sky, is to take a human rights approach. I said this before, this isn't a gender issue, this isn't a, a women's issue or a men's issue, it's a human rights issue that we need to combat these inequalities. And we can do that when we're, when we're being disaster responsive. And number six, respect and develop the capacities of everyone. Uh, even and including the most vulnerable in any given population. And I, I don't say any specific population there because vulnerability is going to vary from place to place. Uh, now, one of the neat things that we're doing as part of the Gender and Disaster Resilience Alliance is that we are trying not there yet, but we're uh, working on a women building disaster resilience project. And what we do, or what we're trying to do, and it's really neat because Angela uh, has a nonprofit and she does all sorts of stuff in disaster areas. Uh, like the, she'll contract with health professionals and before you know it, uh, medical supplies are on the ground in these communities and, and they have control over where it goes and they make sure it gets to the correct people. Uh, they will get food in uh, and it's not just in the U.S. but in different countries. It's just, it's just a non-governmental organization and by the very nature of being non-governmental, they can get a lot of things done that other organizations, FEMA, the Red Cross, the Red Cross is not a governmental organization, by the way, um, but they can't get the same things done. So we're trying to uh, develop this, this project where we can continue to build on that model 
here in the U.S. And what you might then see is that after Katrina, this this uh, group of, of folks can pull together resources and have points of contact. And we already have many points of contact in the Gulf Coast, and you'll have direct lines of communication to the communities that are most at need, and you will be able to look at what the indigenous or the local strategies for coping are and help them in a grassroots fashion get the resources they need through this through this organization. And those are the kinds of things that need to exist across the board. And I think it's really interesting because a lot of the work that is already done like this is at the local level and in these non-governmental organizations, uh, non-profit organizations. You know what the most, or the best organizations that do this is? Religious organizations. The faith-based organizations and communities, they've got it figured out. And while they've got it figured out, we're not all communicating together. And so you have to bridge these gaps and you have to communicate well together. I can speak on behalf of this and do not quote me on it, but the Red Cross doesn't necessarily have it figured out. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a, a local Red Cross volunteer. The Red Cross does many things very, very well. But the only outreach we have to the faith-based community is that we ask them if we can use their churches as shelters. <laughs> uh, but last last fall I went into a shelter um, we had one set up in uh, the community and if it wouldn't have been for the church volunteers we would not have been able to operate that shelter because we had about four staff uh, we had one paid staff member and then three of us were volunteers and that was it and we had about 30 church members that came in and they're the ones that made sure that the community needs were met. It wasn't really us as members of the Red Cross. So we have to work with these uh, community-based organizations and the goal of this project, and it's really exciting, is to do something. So with that, I'm going to stop and ask if anyone